gap between what we were doing pre-COVID, which is way back in 2019, and today, 2023. The last four years, it's been like a bit of a void, hasn't it? It's, everyone's so disorientated by COVID and what happened then. The lockdowns, the vax, and the whole government sort of chaos around it. The, the world events, what happened in America when Donald Trump had his election stolen from him. And we were all totally disorientated by that. Because uh, before COVID, I just saw the victory pact for the nationalist parties. We were going from strength to strength. I was totally convinced Donald Trump was going to win a second term. Yeah, and uh, I didn't realise that they would actually create a scandemic to stop it. Because that's why I believe that was the essential reason why that scandemic was created. So they could move to postal votes and they could have this great cheat across many states of America and deprive uh, Donald Trump of his, his rightful uh, role in the second term. And it took the wind out of our sails because Donald Trump's first term was amazing and see the nationalist movements around the world. We were fighting back against globalism and we were bringing common sense back into politics. And I thought it was real hope. So I was very disillusioned when uh, what happened in America and then when it, he failed to get justice and we've had the Biden administration and the lunacy that's going on there now. And then we also, Boris Johnson, once he realized Biden was gonna win, he moved to the left to fit in with Biden's agenda. Because when we got Boris Johnson elected in 2019, again, he had great expectations. We were gonna get Brexit done, we were gonna get immigration brought under control, we were gonna get common sense brought back into the uh, body politic in Britain, instead of all this left-wing nonsense. But Boris Johnson is a charlatan, and he fitted in with, with Biden. He knew where the power had moved, so he went with that. And so we felt, I kind of felt disappointed by that, very disappointed. And uh, of course, we got, I got involved with the um, anti-vax campaigns. My mother got the vax. She developed blood clots in her legs and she died. The vax killed her. She was 78. And uh, you know, and this happened to a lot of families. Um, we met you, he was on the bus. I said, where are you going? You're going to see the wife in the hospital. She's got COVID. How do you know she's got COVID? The doctor said. What are the symptoms? She's got blood clots in the neck. He said, has she had the vax? He said, yeah. So that's the vax, is not that? She died. And my mate, his daughter was pregnant. She got the vax. He said, oh, no. She had a stillbirth. I mean, we, we've, this is a catalogue of, of death. And we, we, we were like deprived of any expression over these issues. I mean, social media shut us down. I was I had a YouTube channel, a very lively, active YouTube channel, getting up to 100,000 hits for videos. Uh, Any time I mentioned COVID, you were taking the videos off straight away. So it'd become futile to post anything. Um, any comments, banned from Facebook, banned from Twitter. I mean, it was ferocious censorship of anyone who questioned the what the establishment were doing over COVID really terrifying. I saw a dictatorship in this country. But I also saw something which was even more terrifying was how gullible people were and how easily they went along with this whole agenda, at least initially, yeah. until voices started to rise. I remember we had this march in Liverpool, right? And there was about 20 of us at Lime Street Station and the police surrounded us, started to intimidate us. You better get on or you'll be going down the station and stuff. And we just thought, let's march, guys. So we, we burst out of the police cordon, marched down past St. John's um, precinct, and just started singing as we were marching, Oh, when the saints go marching in. <laughs> and from nowhere, people came out of the side streets. 2,000 people gathered. There was people waiting for this march in side streets. And, and the police couldn't stop us then. And we saw huge marches in London, so the whole sort of uh, political agenda moved from preserving our nations and stopping all this mass immigration and political correctness to fighting the vax and the COVID, the COVID scam. And so everything got very disorientated, but now we're coming back to normality again now, we're going back to the bread and butter issues. And um, we're faced with this one big issue in this country, replacement, the great replacement. We, the British people, 
are being pushed out of our own nation. He could call it the Kaleji plan, goes back a long way. He planned a long time for this agenda. Who are they? The globalists. Destroying the nation state and undermining the European peoples. And um, they're bringing in incredible numbers of immigrants. <clears throat> and it's, the momentum is just out of control now. I mean, we, talk, we see these four boats coming across the channel, but they're coming in by planes and boats and trains. A million people came into this country last year, one year, a million people. A huge number of those will go on to the welfare state and if effectively colonised our welfare state. Like, we don't have an NHS problem in this country. We have an immigration problem. The NHS is overwhelmed by immigrants who never contributed to the penny. It's free at the point of use and they're milking into the hilt. You know, there's so many issues and so many problems that be in this country are due to the mass uncontrolled immigration. Now, I saw a statistic that 80% of Muslims in this country are dependent on state benefits. And they're not just dependent like old people, you know, slowly dying off. They're having huge families on state benefits. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten kids. And they've all got to be get their free education, their free health care, their free this, that a lot of them are living on benefits. Huge cost. I mean, this is why we've got this um, runaway inflation now, because we've got a serious fiscal pro policy uh, problem in this country. The governments have spent way too much money, and they're borrowing to finance it, and this is generating the inflation. And this is true across the Western world, because they're all following the same agenda. But the end game is, we, the British people, just as the Dutch people, and the German people, and the French people, and wherever else, Scandinavian people, Spanish people, we're becoming a lower and lower percentage of our nations. Like, uh, I remember when I first started raising these issues in the mid-80s, mid and saying, look, there's an attack. See, before the Great Replacement, there was the Great Sterility. What I mean by that is, they started a program to make us a sterile nation, to stop us breeding, they started saying we had the overpopulation. We started saying that we had to have a smaller family. We had to go for maybe a woman in Britain. I mean, my mother had four kids. You should only have two kids. And if you have more than two kids, you're somehow, uh, you, you've done wrong. It's, it's a bad thing to have children. Uh, convince us to have smaller and smaller families. And um, this was done. I was watching a guy on the internet, Paul Ehrlich, who was an American Jew, and he said, this is how we do it. We do television programs. No one has more than two kids. If anyone has more than two kids, we criticise it. We created this stigma about having more than two children. Two children to start, we can get it down to one child. We're going to have mass abortion. Let's start killing the unborn children in the West. So if we kill off their children, there'll be no future for the West. Let's promote the homosexual agenda <clears throat> and get people away from reproductive sex to sort of all sorts of perverted sex, you know. Um, and this is all in cultural Marxism. The, the, the German Jews in Frankfurt in the 1920s wrote all sorts of books about this. Hermann Marcuse, Thomas Adorno, Max Horkheimer. This is how we destroy the West. We stop, we break the family down, we make divorce easy. We, we, we take them out of churches. We don't want them learning Christian messages and Christian morals anymore. Let's promote immorality or amorality, no morality at all. And uh, this was all their agenda way back in the 1920s. They, they hatched, hatched all this. This is how we, we Marxists, destroy the West from within. And then, as, as we get the fertility levels to decline, we start saying there's not enough workers. We bring in people from the third world, from Africa, from Asia. We change the demographic of the nation. And uh, once we change the demography of the nation, becomes a different nation. It ceases to be what it was. It loses touch with its roots. We cut it off from its history. People become disorientated and confused. Um, anything which makes life worth living, family, faith, patriotism, we rubbish that and turn people away from it. Get people, you know, lead them on a slippery slope to destruction. And that's what they've done. And they bought the government's big money, the Soros's of this world, the the Bloombergs of this world, you know, the New York billionaires. They bought the politicians of the world. They bought them. And to push this agenda of destroying the Western nations, breaking up our identity, 
taken away our future, they become the, the dominant strata now. They, they form themselves into global institutions like the EU, like the United Nations, like the World Economic Forum, like the International Monetary Fund or the World Bank. And these global institutions, like the World Health Organization during the pandemic, dictate this to the law to the governments, the national governments. And um, it's just an agenda that's unfolded over the years until 2016. Suddenly there was two spikes put into their wheels. One was Brexit, which they didn't think we would vote for Brexit, that we would actually cut free from the EU. And yeah. the other, of course, was Donald Trump, who was a populist in America, who was saying, like, we're going to stop this mass immigration. Because the mass immigration is the key element of it. The key element of the Great Reset is the Great Replacement. Once they strip away our sense of citizenship, our democratic, democratic power, then they have control. Everything becomes, you know, top down. They manipulate the masses. Because we are active citizens, we're all thinkers here. We're here tonight because we've thought through these issues. We have our own sense of identity. We've held on to what was good, our traditional views of British life. We've held on to it. We refuse to be castigated for being British or being white or being Christians. We, we don't see that as like some sort of ill. We see that as our strength. We see that as, as a, the goodness, that we, the rock on which we can stand in life. And we're not going to get off that rock. See, the whole thing is to seduce you, to come off the rock, the rock of Christ, the rock of nationhood, and to jump into the sea, to turn the other sea. <clears throat> And there's supposed to be liberty and freedom in the sea. You can be anything you want in the sea, but you're not. You're just in chaos. It's just a disaster. Yeah. Everyone who becomes totally disorientated. And what happens? You drown. You die. This is the death of our nation. We have to stay on that rock. We've got to hold on to that rock and say that rock is worth preserving. Get back on the rock. Come back to the people we were. Some guy said, are you some sort of Christian fanatic? Do you want to take us into a, into a sort of um, theocracy like Iran? I said, no, I want to go back to 1967, before Labour, uh, you know, legalised abortion and sodomy and easy divorce and, and, and undermined their family in this country. I want to go back to my childhood in the 1960s in Walton and Liverpool when I was a happy child in a happy community and we had a great sense of ourselves. That's good people. It was a positive, healthy environment. That's what I want. That's all I want. But even I'd, I'd take going back to 1996 before Tony Blair got the power and started to warp this country and started to destroy this country from within and open the floodgates for the whole third world to just pour into our nation. So if you go to Bradford, you go to Birmingham, you go to London, you go to Luton, you go to Coventry, you go to Leicester, blah, 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 blah. These cities have been transformed. You feel like an alien in your own country. You gave them the right to do that. We never voted for that. And yet, just to protest against it, I say, look, we want to preserve what we had. We want to preserve who we are. And we want to pass it on to the future generations, which is a very healthy trait. To simply hold on to that is to be condemned as somehow you, 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 you're despicable. You're an evil person. You see? <clears throat> Yeah, and they've got this great word, this R word that we all know, and they keep using it all the time, which means nothing, which just means you cannot defend what is yours. You can't defend your inheritance. Now, I'm standing here in front of the Union flag, and I know that the British went round the world in an incredibly benevolent spirit. And they went to country after country, and they built roads, and they built hospitals, and they built churches, and they developed the economy, and, and they evil practices and cruelty, they outlawed, they brought in decent laws, and people respected. People loved being part of the British Empire. I mean, we had India, which is one of the, now I think it's now the biggest population in the world, I think they've now overtaken China. India is a vast country, as big as Europe, it's got a population twice the size of Europe, we control the whole of India with a few thousand people and a few thousand troops. Hundreds of millions of people. How did we do that? Because they appreciated what we brought. They couldn't believe that our, the British officials were not corrupt. They didn't steal the taxes like their officials. 
They didn't believe that the British would take the money out of India and would use it to build a railway network around India, an educational system around India, all sorts of improvements in the Indian way of life. They, they, they thought, who are these British people? Why are they like this? Because we were Christians. We believed in doing good works. John read that passage before, you know, let your good works shine before men. We were decent people. And we won't accept this betrayal because we know, we know our parents and our grandparents. My grandparent mother, Anne, she was from North Wales originally, one of the sweetest women you'd ever meet in your life. She, could, she went around her whole life helping people. You know, she went around her whole life blessing people. And this, was, this is what we know that British people were like in the past. We all had a childhood, you know, there's people here, I'm 60 now, so I'm getting along in the tooth, you know. One minute a young up and comer, the next minute, be long in the tooth, you know. <laughs> so, you know, but, uh, so I've got a lot of experience to look back on. I can, uh, my political awakening came in April 1968, when Enoch Powell made a speech, and it was broadcast live on ITN News. And it was right in our living rooms. I was just a young boy then, six years old. But I can remember the impact of it. He said, it's like watching a nation building its own funeral pyre. You're destroying yourself. You know, this, this uh, he said, 50,000 people a year coming into Britain. Of course, last year it was a million. He said, it's going to transform the country. It's going to transform the culture. It's going to create what John talked about before, segregation in every city, community against community. I mean, so far, we've had the wealth to buy peace. But given what's happened now with the cost of living crisis, the rampant inflation, the surging interest rates, and the economic crunch which is about to happen, the wealth might be there. The wealth has bought peace in this country, but that might soon come to an end. And each community will have to start fighting for the resources. And that could get very nasty. But anyway, when Enoch Powell made that speech, I used to live in, in, in Walton, off County <coughs> Road. And County Road in Walton on a Saturday was electric. It was alive, the shops, the pubs. The, I mean, we used to go to the Astoria Picture House, you know, before we would watch Saturday morning telly, we'd go to the pictures on a Saturday morning. And it was alive. I mean, it was really alive. There was thousands of people in County Road. But I remember going in the pub and all the fellas, you could hear them saying, Enoch Powell's right. Enoch Powell is right. And it was like a rebellion of the working class against Harold Wilson, who was in power at the time. But the Tories, because Harold Wilson had brought in all sorts of legislation, <clears throat> so you couldn't say this, you couldn't say that, and Labour was opening the floodgates to immigration then. And Powell had risen up. The Tories had sort of stayed mute, and Powell rose up and said that speech. And, and uh, he was so respected amongst ordinary working class people. It was, it was electric, you know, at the time. My dad loved them. And I remember him coming on the telly. Dad was shooting up powers on, you know. And, um, and it changed Britain, really. Because I think in, in 1970, I mean, Harold Wilson had a huge majority. He was hot favourite to get re-elected. He got beat by Ted. That was because of Powell. Because Powell told the, the British working class not to vote Labour in 1970. But then he turned out a total snake and a rat, and uh, he sold us out to the EU, he lied to us. And uh, so Powell had to, she had to say, look, don't vote for Heath. We need a referendum. We let the, the problem with Powell was he should have formed his own party, like a UKIP-like party, and he would have swept the board. But he never. And so we went through the 70s, and uh, the 70s were a turbulent time, I remember that. And, um, the National Front were there, 76. Now, we, we were patriots. I, I had actually never met any members of the ethnic minorities. I, hadn't, I didn't have any hatred towards anyone, but I had a great love for my country and my flag. And I had a great love for um, the British people. And, and if the British people were gonna be replaced or invaded, I was gonna stand up for the British people. And it was simple as that. There was no, there was no doubt about that. Now, that didn't go anywhere. In 1979, Margaret Thatcher picked up the baton and she, um, she got elected. She changed the whole political climate in Britain at the time in 1979. And uh, of course, uh, in Liverpool, I was telling Ian before, in June 1979, in a, our first European elections, <laughs> elections of the European Parliament, 
Liverpool voted for Margaret Thatcher in 19, June 1979. Not many people know that. And, uh, but sadly, what happened was we had the Great Recession in the early 80s and people turned against Margaret Thatcher because of unemployment. And, um, but it was only a, a, a transitory thing. We had the Falklands War and then we had um, a period of sustained economic growth in the 80s and things, especially I went to live in London in, in 1985. But uh, I'd actually, in between that, in 1981, I was fortunate enough to get a place at Cambridge University, right? And uh, I was a left winger then. I'd sort of got swept up in what was happening in Liverpool. I had left wing teachers, militant tendency. I was reading Karl Marx. I actually went into a left wing period. And then Mrs. Thatcher turned up at Cambridge at Robinson College. And uh, my mate was there, Mark Adam, who actually worked in number 10 Downing Street at one stage. He had eggs. He said, Throw some eggs at Mrs. Thatcher. And everyone went, Ooh, some police were there. I said, I'll throw two. So I got two eggs. Mrs. Thatcher was over there. <laughs> and threw an egg at Mrs. Thatcher. And as the egg came towards her, she just moved away. Just took the wall behind her. I thought, That's a stop. But in 1983, she won a landslide. And I started to, started to take it seriously. And I thought, Well, I'm looking at ideas. And I actually started to agree with a lot of what she said, you know. And, um, so much so that when she died in 2013, I went to, was it 2013, it was, yeah. uh, I, went, I went to the uh, funerals in St. Paul's Cathedral, you know, went down with a few friends. And, um, yeah, they were all there, the great and good, you know, Jeremy Clarkson, uh, Cecil Parkinson, I saw there, spoke to Norman Tebbett again, I met Norman Tebbett a few times, and, um, yeah, we, we said farewell to Maggie, and then after the funeral, we had a, a meeting in a pub in London. Ian will love this now. We had a meeting in a pub in London, and uh, all the Tories were there, had been to Margaret Thatcher's funeral. It was an open mic. Did anyone want to say anything? I thought, well, I'm a quiet, retiring scouser. I'll have a go. <laughs> <laughs> so I told that story about it through the exit, Mrs. Thatcher to Cambridge, and I have been turned around and actually I come to appreciate her. And I said, I hope when I see it in heaven that she begins with me, you know. But uh, I said, you know, the thing about Mrs. Thatcher was she had great ideas about how to reform the economy, privatisation, cut taxes. She made Britain rich again. I said, but the thing about Mrs. Thatcher is she loved Britain. She loved the British people. She loved our history. But there was, there was one thing there. As I said that, she had great faith in the British people. There was a, three or four Asian lads who were Tories who started jeering, saying, well, they know all this British stuff. One of them was Rishi Sunak. Now, this, these, these people, obviously, the, he's a conservative, but he's not a patriot. He doesn't love this country. He, he, he's Indian, isn't he? He's got, he hasn't got a drop of British blood in his veins. In fact, he celebrated Diwali, the Hindu festival, because he's a Hindu. That's his faith, that's his culture. But, um, he didn't celebrate Christmas. He didn't give a Christmas message. Didn't think it was appropriate, you know, because he's not a Christian. I thought, how can we have a guy like that leading our country? When he talks about stopping the boats or getting control of immigration, he's just lying to us. I mean, the thing is with politicians, they willingly lie. And he's not going to do anything about it. He's going to, the great replacement, which is destroying this nation, is speeding up. Or should I say, it's accelerating downhill because this is a collapse into the death of Britain and we can see now I think we can see the end game it's, the demographics changing so rapidly now that we can see that in, uh, within 10 years British people British children may well be a minority in their own country over the next 10 years that means the future the youth the energy in this nation is no longer with us it's with other people and uh, it's a terrifying scenario because we are a benevolent people, as I said earlier on, when we took the empire around the world. We are a decent people, we are moral people, we want justice. A lot of people are nothing like that at all. They want their way, and it's only their interests that matter, and you will be kicked into touch. You will put, be pushed in the margin, and you will be pushed overboard. And so we've got to fight our corner. There's still enough of us, and there's still enough tradition of democracy and freedom in this country for us to rise up and fight our corner. 
I am a freeborn Englishman and I hold on to that because that gives me the right to speak my mind and to say the truth when I see it. I will not be intimidated. I've been arrested three times on politically trumped up charges. Each time I've turned the tables on the police and won each case. Now, when Labour was in power, Keir Starmer is the head of the Crown Prosecution Service. He prosecuted me twice. Keir Starmer is a rat. He will, he will, if Labour get power again, it was Gordon Brown who said, don't interfere with these rape gangs. The girls are up for it. They get what they, you know, deserve, basically, or what they want. Uh, Labour allowed that. I mean, when Theresa May become Home Secretary, she stood against it and stopped it. But if Labour get back in power, we're going to see an attack on the indigenous population that we've never seen before. We're going to see um, resources drawn from us, taken away from us, and given to the immigrants, whatever immigrant community it is. We're going to be attacked and vilified constantly in the media. Anyone who speaks in defence of the British people will be probably criminalised very quickly. The police will be used almost like the KGB in Russia. They'll be used to destroy any opposition. Uh, will be anyone who stands against Labour's agenda will lose their jobs. Will be there'll be no. I mean, that's bad enough now. And in the public sector, it'll be even worse. Uh, <coughs> it's not a pretty picture to paint, you know. Doesn't have to be that way. But we can only stop it if people have the boldness to stand up and speak the truth. And uh, as Pat said, you know, he spoke the truth. He stood for elections. There's no, we still live in a democracy. We still have the freedom to speak our mind on these issues, to get organised. And I'm really, I mean, I'm sad to see poor Britain go to, go to uh, you know, go away. But um, the National Housing Party in the UK, we're a Christian party. This is really important. We stand on Christian values. We believe the Renaissance, the rebirth, the reformation of this country begins with turning back to God, focusing on God again. We were a Christian nation, really, from the 6th century until very, very recently, 40, 1500 years. It's who we are as a people. I mean, some people say, oh, we're not, we're a pagan nation. We're not pagan at all. I mean, there's been no continuity in that at all, you know. Um, it was Christianity that made this nation, that gave us our culture and our identity and our values. And we are a Christian party. And um, there, is a, there is a force now in America called Christian nationalism. I've always believed in Christian nationalism. And um, we stand up for our nation, as the Bible said, God made the nations and he made the borders between the nations to create order and create peace. You take away those borders, chaos reigns. But if God is for the nation, we need our Christian values, we need to, our morality, we need the family back, we need a Christian identity again, we need, as I say, to respect marriage between a man and a woman. We need to welcome children into the world, our children, our future, see children as a blessing from God and not a curse. I believe it is fundamentally evil to kill an unborn child. And I know a lot of women in this country about abortions. There is forgiveness in God for that, but we don't want any more women to have abortions because it's, it's not healthy. Most abortions are healthy mothers killing healthy children, and it's not right. I know, I, I, you know, this is, it's, you know, this, this is what I feel as a Christian. The Lord speaks to me over these issues. And, um, oh, you know, there's a power of suggestion as well. We see this whole transgender agenda at the moment. And young kids are being asked in school, are they in the right body? Do they feel comfortable in their own body? And that's a power of suggestion there. You open their mind up, you're playing with their imagination. Who am I? What is my identity? What body do I really belong in? This is warping children. This is an abuse of children. It's child abuse. It's despicable in my eyes. There's no justification for it at all. All this has got to stop. I mean, thankfully in America, the forces of good, the forces of evil are equally divided. It's 50-50 Republican Democrats. There's a real battle going on over these issues. And in the near future, the Republicans may well triumph. 
and that will be good. That will give us a great spare because hopefully that will spill over into this country. But we have to take a stand. And it's great that whatever networks we can form, at the moment we've got to form networks. We've got to stay in touch, we've got to encourage each other, we've got to bring more people on board, we've got an educational role, we've got an organisational role, and we've got a leadership role. Because we can't rely on the established parties that are wasting space. We've got to rise up as a people. And, and you know, the British people have done this in the past. In the past, you know, we, we've had the Chartists when they, 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 they refused to give working class people the vote. You know, we had the English Civil War when the King thought he could rule as a tyrant and he was overthrown. You know, we've had uh, the Peasants' Rebellion, we've had the Magna Carta. The British are peace loving people, but they demand justice. If there's no justice, the British get upset. When the government starts stealing our resources and giving it to other people, give financing foreign wars, pouring money into other countries like the finance, they pour money into India and China, who are actually getting richer than us now, far richer, but we give them aid. And, you know, all these people, every bogus asylum seekers, because they're just international criminals, this asylum thing is absolutely nonsense coming from war-torn France. I mean, you know, France, you know, why do you have to escape from France? It's absurd. How can you claim asylum from France? It's absolute madness. But each one of these people that come over on the boats, brought over by Serco, put into hotels by Serco, given social housing, each single asylum seeker costs £65,000 per annum. So over 10 years, because they stay on the benefits, over 10 years, probably cost a million quid, each asylum seeker. And these, and these are not just the ones coming over on the boats. These are the ones also who are here. It's cut, the whole immigration racket is costing this country tens of billions of pounds. And we can't afford it now. The country's bankrupt. We've got over a trillion pounds worth of debt. And do you know what a trillion is? It's a thousand billion pounds. A thousand, thousand million pounds. That's just the national debt of this country. Now, you can't even get your head around that figure, can you? We're paying interest on that now, and the interest rates are shooting up, so it's going to get more and more expensive. I tell you what, the government's got no money. And they're not going to be able to like print money like they did with the credit crunch to get out of the, the problem, because inflation will stop them doing that. They're going to have to start making tough decisions of cutting spending, increasing taxes, and we're all facing this cost of living crisis. We're seeing the price of basic foodstuffs like cheese and butter and milk and whatever. It's going through the roof. You pick up a little lump of cheese, it's three quid. You pick up a tub of butter, it's seven pounds. I mean, people, people are going to face real poverty again in this country. We thought it was a thing of the past, real poverty, but it's about to hit us. And all these lavish benefits that they give be given to immigrants since the Second World War, well, no one will be able to finance them. And what are the immigrant communities going to do? We had a little taste of that with BLM in London. And uh, the truth is, and I, I heard a prison guard say yesterday, we don't control the prisons anymore. The ethnic gangs control the prisons now. We don't control our cities anymore. We saw that in BLM. When the BLM mob ran at the police, the police left it. Did anyone remember that? The police left it. We'd never seen the police behave like that in Britain. They turned around and they left it as fast as they could. I.e., they are running the show, not us. And it's going to be happening in our cities. It's going to become lawless, you know. This is like a dystopia which is unfolding. But it's like it says in the Bible. You reap what you sow. You sow to the wind, you reap the whirlwind. And we're going to reap a whirlwind. So how we, we're going to have to come together in groups to defend ourselves and believe that. Because the state's not going to defend us anymore. The police are a waste of time. The army's being cut to a minimum. Never forget my fight in Russia or China. We've hardly got any soldiers out there anymore. You know, the army aren't going to come on the street and protect us. We're going to have to protect ourselves. You know, it's a scary scenario because we, we're used to social peace in Britain. We're used to having a state that functions. If it starts to unravel, it could unravel very fast. It could become quite desperate in this country. I really believe that. And I'm going to see this across Western Europe. 
because you can't be so reckless with your nation and with your way of life and think there's not going to be any consequences. There's going to be serious consequences. But never give in because it's we, the people, that will ultimately make the choice. If we, the people, get mobilised, stick together, come together, we're still an unstoppable force. We have to educate people. People have been brainwashed for a long time and indoctrinated, but all that's going to fall by the wayside very quickly because people have still got common sense. They still can be very realistic. When, as, it, as we saw over with COVID, initially they were just sheep or lambs for the slaughter, but the, the dissent began to grow and grow. <clears throat> the government would never try another lockdown because we wouldn't tolerate it anymore. And I think people have, have now know that it is fake news, it is manipulation, it is mind warping, it is a cycle. That's all these people do, they play games with us. It's not in our interest, they don't care about us. Would they allow this to happen to our country if they cared about us? No, they care about themselves and their own futures and their own careers. I mean, Ricky Sunak, Rishi Sunak said, I want to go and live in California when I've made me millions. This is just a stepping stone. Now we want people that run in our country who care about the British people. I think we deserve that. And um, it's time for rebellion really guys. But that rebellion can only happen when we come together as a people again. And now how do we do that? We've got Twitter. On Twitter now we can speak the truth. You can say this. I mean, we started an NHP UK account on Twitter. I thought, you know, you might get a couple of thousand followers, 20,000 followers. People are desperate to hear the truth. They want to hear bold voices who are telling them what is actually going on and what we need to do to resolve it. And uh, so it's uh, going to be an adventurous time over the next two or three years. Things are going to get pretty, pretty uh, choppy, you know. Things are going to get choppy. And uh, we're going to be there in the midst of it all. It's the patriots that are still the hope of this country. <laughs> We've got a new vehicle now, the National Housing Party, the National Party, National Housing Party of the UK. Bring us all together and let's fight back and let's defend what we have. Thank you.